Well, hello everyone and welcome to HydroTerra's latest webinar. Today we're joined by Mark Taylor, Chief Environmental Scientist from EPA Victoria, and he's going to be talking all about measuring what matters in the community. Got a great turnout for this one, so thanks very much for your time. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydra Terra respectfully acknowledges the Boon people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. There's a picture of Mark. A little bit about our presenter today. So Professor Mark Patrick Taylor is Victoria's Chief Environmental Scientist at EPA. He is also an honorary Professor of Environmental Science and Human Health at Macquarie University. He has over 25 years of experience in his field with expertise in environment, geochemistry, environmental health, environmental forensics, and citizen science. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters and has received numerous awards and recognitions for his research and teaching excellence. He is also a passionate advocate for science communication and public engagement. What that formal introduction doesn't cover is some of Mark's other background. So he's a geologist like myself. He studied uh, geography and geology which is a very important skill to have. He did his PhD focused on anthropogenic impact on sediments of the Pliocene era. And I have the geologists in the room, that will make some sense. Uh, in 1999, he came to Australia after having completed his studies in Wales University at Arba Oostwick. How did I go, Mark? Did that sound right? Uh no, shocking. Have a risk with. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's fair to say that Mark is truly passionate about making sure science is useful and about sharing knowledge and making sure that that knowledge is applicable to what the community needs. And definitely in our chat before this, it became clear that there's a real passion there. So we're lucky to have, oh, sorry, lucky to have Mark here today. Before we get started, apology. No problem here. Um, we love your Q and A. We would like lots of questions. We've already got uh, thirteen early bird questions, so that's fantastic. Thanks to those who sent them in. Obviously, you'll have more questions as we go, and you do that by using the Q and A button at the top of your screen. Um, just type those in, and I will read those questions out at the end, Mark and we'll do our best to answer them. If we can't answer them today, we'll let you know that and do our best to get an answer after the webinar. Why does HydroTerra do this? We're passionate about sharing knowledge. We like to facilitate education and we like to help industry by taking a bit of a leadership role in really bringing people together because that's when the magic happens. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Mark. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you to the 125, 26 participants who've enrolled. And um, appreciate the time. It's Friday. And uh, we're all looking forward to uh, the weekend to get back to what we were doing for pretty much the last month, which is enjoying uh, the summer holiday period. So what I'd like to talk to you today is a bit of a combination of um, some of the stuff that we do in EPA, uh, but largely like why we would do it, you know, measuring what matters in the community. And I think um, I, uh, what really excites me about talking about this stuff is because we can measure and do all sorts of studies and analyses, but the crux of science is is our social license to be scientists and to show the value and the benefit of doing science 
for, for the general public. Uh, clearly, um, many of us on this call, I would suspect, uh, are doing work as consultants or government agent agencies or even academics for, for industry. But there are, you know, industry is a small component of society. It's not unimportant. It's clearly important. And it's clearly important that, you know, we they are regulated appropriately, etc. But also to bring the community along uh, about the value and benefit of science, about why we would monitor, what we would monitor for, and, and what that all means, I think is a really critical role. And I think um, the whole COVID epidemic was a really a uh, great opportunity and I think it was graph to demonstrate the value and benefit of science of protecting public health. And so that's where I'm coming from, um, measuring what matters. So there are some things that we're doing, I'll talk about here that we do for the outreach for EPA. And then I'll, I'll talk about some of the fun stuff that I've done as a scientist, some of the, some of the things that we all enjoy or we use, which you might find interesting. And then I'll come back right at the end and I'll just go into the next slide because I think it describes what I'm, I'll cover. Um, oh, well, that's my measure. Let's go into the next slide. And then, uh, then we come right back at the end, a, a new piece of work that some of you may have seen recently on the ABC. We're developing uh, a distress index with the University of Adelaide to allow us to assess impact from pollution and waste uh, on communities. So at the moment we can measure the physical emissions and uh, depositions, uh, but it's much harder for us to categorize and measure and assess harm to people. And our act says uh, human health also includes psychological health, and we don't really have a tool or a mechanism to address it at the moment. And that last bit I'm gonna talk about is about closing that gap. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So th this is the EPA. So some of you will be super familiar, some of you will be less familiar, but as you can see, EPA is made up of uh, seven divisions and we all contribute to the goal of EPA, which is to uh, reduce harm and protect people from pollution and waste and reduce impacts to the environment and human health. You can see science sits next to legal. It doesn't literally sit next to legal, but it does in this graph. And we're an enabling function. We support the rest of the organisation. We uh, critical in delivering innovative and targeted science advice to support strategy, policy development, and strategic and operational decision making. We provide input to EESs, uh, major projects, for example, uh, also and also permissioning and licensing. And sciences underpins EPA's work. Uh, the board and the CEO and the government have been really clear that you know we're a science-led organisation, and indeed. Science is critical to pretty much every decision that is made that influences outcomes in the field, whether it's for uh, people who regulate community or, or the broader community. Let's go on to the next one. So science itself is made up of uh, about 100 staff. We are like the United Nations and it's fantastic. We have people from all over the globe and, and I apologize to my staff if I don't capture every Place, but we've got people from the African continent, the South American continent. Um, I think we've got people from the North American continent. We have people from several parts of Asia, subcontinent, and 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 Europe. So it's a it's it's a really it's a really diverse community. Many of the staff have got um, higher degrees, like masters or PhDs, and in particular, some of our subject matter experts. I've been in the game for a long time, and I'm sure many of you will know one of our most charismatic uh, staff members, if you do anything to do with air, which is uh, Dr. Paul Torrey. Um, I also have two fantastic deputies. I have uh, Dr. Martin Denikamp, who looks after the public health branch, and um, Dr. Jen Martin, which looks after environmental sciences. And I'll just come on to that structure in a minute. We have statewide monitoring networks covering, and I think we're the only EPA that has monitoring networks and programs that explicitly provide community. And maybe I've got that wrong, but we have a program in air. Nearly every EPA does air, or the sister organization, and, and that's Airwatch. We do some stuff in water, which is around beach report, and we do some work down in the Gippsland Lakes, but our beach report and Yarra Watch are our, our key touch points. Of course, we've got a team that goes out uh, does marine sampling, uh, which feeds into DECA's um, needs. 
Um, and we also do obviously you know, operations type stuff. But we've also got a soil program and I'll touch on that a bit in this program. And we've done quite a lot of work in soil most recently with respect to a new program called Garden Safe, which is a sort of a, a, a spin off from Veggie Safe, which I developed at Macquarie University and has been running for 10 years. I'll talk a little bit about that. And so we have these outward facing programs covering air, soil, water that help the community uh, execute their GD, the general environmental duty to minimize harm. Uh, uh, from uh, adverse outcomes in the environment. We're also, science is highly involved in pollution response. We also have, um, uh, we're supporting and we um, make sure that the um, incident response vehicles uh, and the staff are appropriately trained. So following the floods, we were able to uh, up, uplift and upgrade uh, vehicles so that every every region has a response vehicle, which is pretty much geared out the same thing as the emergency pollution response vehicles. It's got onboard in situ testing and monitoring equipment. Effectively, it's the state of the art. And I'm proud to say, and, and, and I make no bones about bragging it, but I think we have the best equipped um, regional teams uh, and also metro teams with our response vehicles because every one of those teams in the location have got a vehicle that allows them to respond to an incident in express time. And I think we're the only agency um, authority across the nation that has such gear. And we've also got laboratories where we're able to undertake in situ uh, research and assessment. And one of the things that we developed since I've arrived is a portable XRF laboratory which helps support our garden safe program that helps us join the floods, but it also helps us deal with uh, other incidents or issues associated with mine contamination or, or legacy contamination. And, and, you know, I'm talking to an audience here who will know full well that, you know, the gold fields, you know, there are some challenges around arsenic and we've been using our XRF um, equipment uh, and capacity to understand uh, what that means. And of course, science is involved in uh, intelligence gathering, modeling, intelligence gathering meaning collecting data at a particular site and, and also undertaking modeling. We also have a citizen science team, prefer preferably uh, we like to call it community science where we do outward facing work and we'll touch on that very briefly. That's the team. I'm supported by an amazing bunch of people. So whatever I do is really a reflection of whatever they do. Um, um, and some people have been around um, quite a long time and quite experienced, uh, and particularly when we look at our teams, when we come further down here uh, in air odor noise, Mick Ernst, Land and Water Services, uh, Dr. Barry Warwick and uh, Water Sciences Unit, Dr. Carolyn Martino, they're, they're long-termers at the EPA, they know how things work, they're deeply experienced and they, have, they give fantastic added value and support to the teams to help us execute our remit. I mentioned my two deputies before. In addition to that, I've got a, a partnership lead, leadership team, which is run and supported by uh, Carla Tadic. And sitting under there, we have science services where we provide advice uh, when it comes in uh, from the call center. And we also run a citizen science program, which includes a little bit of air monitoring on request, but largely around the garden safe program. And we're probably a new program, or we're looking at starting a new program using eDNA, with uh, First Nations groups. And of course, I've got a support office, including uh, Megan and, and Leander. So that's the, you know, that's the overall look in science. So environmental sciences, what do we do? Well, the branch, which is run by Jen Martin, provides advice, information. We do publications as well, and we've got KPIs attached to that, and run programs on air, odor, noise, land, groundwater, waste, emerging contaminants, and water sciences. It's an exhausting list of things that helps EPA meet the needs of us being a science-based regulator. Uh, public health branch, uh, really important because public health came over about six years ago, uh, post the Hazelwood matter into science. And we are, I think we're explicitly, I think the only EPA to have it in-house. We do share some things with health and we've got a memorandum of understanding who does what and we have conversations to make sure we're aligned but we provide high quality information covering public health risks associated chemicals, microbial risks, and toxicology. We've also got an epidemiological component and you know, risk assessment is a really critical part. Human health risk assessment is a really critical part of the work that the public health team provides. And then next one. And I mentioned the science partnerships. The purpose of the partnerships is for us to have proactive science 
We reach out, maintain our partnerships with uh, key end users and key science producers. That includes CRC, CSIRO, uh, universities and the like, and including also government other government agencies um, in Victoria. The team is important in providing good science advice. That's the science advice service running citizen science projects and building those relationships with the community so that people can understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how they themselves can act uh, to better protect themselves. And some of the work that we do also supports uh, regulatory decisions. The three main services are listed at the bottom. So um, what's happened in EPA since we got the new act? No, we can skip on from that, it's fine. I think people can read that. Thanks, Richard. So we had a new act in, in 2017 and um, we're now just over 50 years of existence. And the new act really allowed us to change the way we approach from rather end of pipe, which is a typical approach that EPAs apply, deal with the pollution at the end of the pipe or the boundary. We were able to go up to the front end upstream rather than downstream. End. And the focus very clearly is on prevention rather than rehabilitation. And we require um, everybody, actually, as part of the general environmental duty, to make sure that prevention is a key component of all of their activities. We make community central to preventing harm, and we use data. That's absolutely fundamental. Can't make a decision without data, and it helps us give us the best state of knowledge. And I've worked really hard with my team, or probably more correctly, my team have worked really hard with me to try and put... Um, uh, the authority, the capital A, back in science. Um, and a good example of that work is during the floods. Now, I don't know if you remember the floods in uh, 2022. Uh, EPA, for the first time, really were called out to respond to the floods. We, of course, we've done emergency response before with the bushfires, but we'd never really done floods before. Sent the team out to collect samples. And, you know, placing us as being the authority um, looked a little bit like this. So during that whole period of time, we actually went out and collected data. We reported on that data. We collected samples at people's home in terms of the sediments that were deposited. We had an uplifted program. We made our beach report uh, all year round. Um, we did additional sampling in regional rivers. So we could inform the community what was actually in that water. And we have a significant piece of research which is uh, being finalized about the 700 plus chemicals that we looked at in the flood waters. But what the outcome of us taking that more proactive step and being on the front foot, collecting samples and using the samples to provide the evidence and guidance to the community was that the media only came to EPA to say, hey, what's going on with the floods? What are the risks? In, the pre in my previous life, when I was a professor at Macquarie University, I did find that there were times when EPAs wouldn't take that proactive approach and put themselves in front of the media so there was a void and that would then be filled by a university professor who might not really know what's going on in the back room of EPAs and what the data they're collecting, what the challenges and nuances are. But by our team being out in the front foot, media pushing um, us as being the key uh, point source to come and talk to as the authority, it really kind of changed the narrative. So just to stay on the queue, go back Richard, so please. So science really does support all of these aspects of what we call our regulatory queue. But we have, um, we, we, you know, the bits where we're significantly the focus around is the inform and educate, we help set standards and guidelines, and we support um, operations and permissions in, in to comply. And of course, we're also involved in, in monitoring and compliance. And so, the, you know, that's the, that's the, but not entirely, but that's the focus of the work that we do in science. We're an enabling function. We support the other parts of the organisation in order to allow us to execute our remit to better protect the environment from harm. Richard, next slide, thanks, please. So some of the work that we do, and I'll whip through these. Just, just it's a flavour. You know, this is kind of these sort of webinars are kind of an infomercial. So I'll just talk about briefly some of the work. So on the left hand side, we have Beach Report. Everybody can sign up from that. They get text messages each day about the quality of the beaches. We monitor 40 locations in Port Phillip Bay um, and also um, including the Yarra. There's four in the Yarra and there's 36 around the bay. And we, at the moment, we do two reports a day, 10 o'clock, 3 o'clock. And it helps people understand uh, which beaches may be good to go to, better to go to than others. 
and as you would all know, you're all scientists, you all get it. You know, the bay is usually in poor water quality condition when there's rainfall, which causes uh, pollutants upstream. Those are stormwater pollutants that could be from gardens or further upstream, agricultural lots or industrial sites, flushed into creeks, which get flushed out into the bay. And typically, you know, the water quality is worse, closer to outlets into the bay. And typically, as you can see from this example, the more distant you come from the main uh, sources, such as the Yarra, you see, uh, and the Maribyrnong, the, the water quality improves. So what we see is within 24 to 48 hours of a big rain event, it's beach quality improving. And that's available. We do that all year. And the, since the floods of 22, we went from a, a sort of seasonal program to an all year program. And that's really valued by the community. We have a garden safe program, and I mentioned this before, it's a little bit different to the veggie safe program. We measure uh, soil contaminants, but it also includes some nutrients such as phosphorus um, and um, potassium in the soil. But we also look at soil quality indicators such as uh, the composition of soil and, and grain size, as well as uh, trace elements. Citizen science team or the community science team supports that. We've also been able to use that program to give some insights for research and development about focusing and understanding sources and causes and does the outside contaminants get in the inside. We've recently done a piece of work looking not just at trace elements, but also looking at a range of other, you know, typical urban contaminants, pesticides and PFAS, for example, and, uh, PAHs, and the presence of those in veggie patches, front yard and indoor dust and to see, you know, if they're what the prevalence is and what the relationship is, is to outdoors. And the good news is, is that really the, the primary risk that we've identified from that study is, is, is trace elements. And we knew that they were a problem, and particularly in the older, more industrial areas of, uh, of Victoria. And, and same sort of data and outcomes that we've measured in the Veggie Safe program, which has uh, been to more than 12,000 homes. So we've, so far, within less than, with just over a year, visiting uh, 1,000 homes in Victoria has been a fantastic outcome. And the program will be covered on uh, ABC Gardening. I think it's next month. I don't quite have the date, so watch out for that. It's a, it's a great coverage for us for EPA. It's a really super positive program. It's free to engage, send your soil in and you get a report back. And of course, and on the right side, we've got Airwatch, uh, over 50 sites across the state, you know, the populous uh, metropolitan and uh, regional sites are covered. We use that data to help us understand what potential risks are to put out uh, any warnings where they may be the case. We use a mixture of equipment going from sensors to more, uh, more, uh, more standard NADRA accredited equipment, such as high vols in particular areas, which we then use for our NEPM reporting. But the data is available online for the community. You just go onto the website, you can look for your location and find the nearest available air monitor and, and uh, have a, you know, obviously ascertain what the air quality is over the last 48 hours, and all of that data gets pushed up onto, uh, onto Data Vic. Next slide, please. Before we move on, Mark, so the Garden Safe program, are you using that data to make any modifications to the sort of audit overlay uh, side of things? We, so when we did this program, we knew nobody did enrol if it meant they would be subject to um, receiving uh, duty um, duty to notify. We do, we, we've taken a duty to manage approach and um, we give people guidance about, you know, if your soil is contaminated, are there these things that you can do. Um, we've not completely closed the door on going a bit further where we find really significant problems, but that hasn't arisen. And um, the answer is no, not explicitly, but you know, we, we are doing some work up in the Goldfields region to help us better understand the distribution of uh, arsenic uh, legacy contaminants up there. We're actually about to in, uh, start a piece of work using remote sensing data uh, to try and ascertain the distribution of legacy contaminants across the Bendigo area. We've, been, we've done some sampling in that area to look at, set the natural background levels uh, and have a look then at, you know, at, and then also look separately look at what's the contamination, uh, the levels of contamination, the pink sands, the grey sand waste and, and, and natural soils. And then what's the bioavailability of all of those? So the answer is no, not really. It's a community focused program, uh, but it does.
there's some intelligence about the prevalence of contaminants in different parts uh, of the state and what those contaminants look like. And needless to say, it's primarily lead. We know that from other work that we've done, we expected that. That's from lead paint used on buildings and leaded gasoline because those emissions become depositions. Those depositions accumulate and don't go away. Does that help? <laughs> perfect. Thanks, Mark. I've never been told I'm perfect. So, and I already mentioned we've got uh, regional incident response vehicles. Super proud of that. It's a fantastic uplift for EPA. It just gives us the best quality gear to allow us to intervene and assess um, as soon as possible. So it allows us to um, take action based upon information. It allows us also to do better targeted sampling so we can do screening stuff. And, and here we've got sample capacity for gases and water and, and, and um, uh, also some sediment stuff. So as you can see, and then the second one is we use those vehicles to help support and, and some of the approach in there to support our flood response work um, where we collected a massive number of contaminants, 780 contaminants over 18 sites. We also did some work in individual residents' homes. We opened the door, we used the garden safe platform, which we'd already developed to help impacted residents, particularly in the Maribyrnong area, but actually it was more, it was across all of the, all of the uh, government areas that were impacted to send in samples if they so choose. Um, the, study, the flood response data isn't out yet and um, we haven't finished it. We're still in the business of compiling, as you can imagine, with 780 contaminants and all the other work we have to do, it's, it's taken a bit of time, but I've looked at a draft, I've made comments and it's gone back to the team. And then the third bit of work that's going to allow us to respond to events, whether they're natural or unnatural, and our focus is typically around unnatural industrial pollution events, is this gap that I identified and mentioned before, is psychological health. Our act says human health includes psychological health. And when I landed at the EPA, I went, hmm, that's interesting. I've been thinking about this problem since I went to the American Geophysical Union meeting in 2015. And there's an opportunity here I can see to try and close that gap. So we've been working, and I'll talk about this later, with uh, University of Adelaide to develop the Environmental Distress Index, or TEDI. So what we'll be saying is, when in distress, grab your TEDI, tell us how you're feeling, where you are, and we can then use that information to better gu uh, guide and direct um, interventions and support provide that information to other agencies or perhaps better still other agencies can use this tool and that's ultimately the, the plan. All right, next slide please. And um, oh, that's uh, not quite worked out the way I'd like it to work out with that overlay that must be swapping between Mac and Windows. So we undertake uh, quite a bit of applied science research on the left. Um, my colleague in public health Antti Mikkonen has been doing quite a, a lot with Jen Martin, quite a lot of work looking at PFAS in cattle and um, significant amount of research. We've published that work. I should have put the link into the paper. You can find that. You should be able to find that. There's a link right at the end and you'll be able to find the, the paper and it's publicly available. And what Antti's done, he's looked at ways of changing uh, on-farm management to manage the PFAS levels in cattle. Um, and this is not a solution, but this is a management intervention approach to allow um, farm owners to still produce stock that's going to minimise and, and hopefully, uh, it, probably not totally eliminate, but significantly minimise PFAS concentrations in, in stock that are going to go to market. So have a look at that study. The second bit of applied research that we're doing, and this has taken quite a long time to get there, is estimating stock, tyre stockpiles. Now, everybody would know that Waste tyres are a problem. And the, the situation that we have is uh, authorised officers have to count the number of tyres to ascertain if it's above or below the 5,000 tyre threshold, which is the maximum number of tyres we allow a stockpile. Now, I, I've never counted 5,000 tyres, but I might be doing that sooner rather than later because we have a piece of work that we need to do. But it takes a long time. And so we've been working with Macquarie University to develop a model uh, and on that figure that you can see there, that's just a bit of a laboratory-based model using using um, scale tyres in the laboratory to look at the relationship between the volume and the number of tyres. So it's quite easy for us to assess the volume. There's a couple of ways of doing it. 
there's the authorized uh, officer method of pacing it out and doing an estimate, and then we can use drones. So ultimately, what we need to do is go out in the field, do significant do tire piles. We plan to do from 500 through to 7,000 to develop the linear regression, so we can say. The volume that we've measured here equates to this number of tires, which will save our staff having to count 5,000 plus tires. And so that's a piece of work. Uh, we actually went out to market to get somebody to move the tires recently. We haven't have found anybody yet to do that work, but hopefully I'm going to solve it soon. Uh, and so we're working with Macquarie to build that model because there is no, there is the Cal tire method, but that got bounced in court because there's no evidence to demonstrate that the volume calculations that they'd used have been underpinned by some research. So we're closing that gap. And then on the right hand side here, we've been doing some pretty cool science. We've been looking at using a variety of species to understand the prevalence of contaminants uh, in the environment and how mobile they are. We've done some work with earthworms with Melbourne University uh, and what that means in terms of uptake in soils. Uh, along again, more link with Macquarie, it harks back to my uh, relationship with them, but knowing the right people to do the work, been using sparrows uh, to look at the mobility and presence of PFAS in birds. And we know that birds are really good biomonitor because it's from a piece of work that I've done with the key researcher there, which is Matt Gillings. He, he's a PhD student associated with um, EPA. Um, we've done some work at Broken Hill and we show that um, blood lead levels in sparrows mimic very closely those in children and we know that because we've actually got measures in children measures in sparrows and they're all spatially aggregated and there is a uh, preprint publication online that you can find and, and, and that article has now gone to um, environmental science and technology uh, for review purposes and of course we've also used uh, i've done several studies as have other of my colleagues done studies looking at uh, European honeybees as biomarkers for pollution. I recently published a study, two studies, one with my colleague, um, Cara Fry, looking at trace metals and antimicrobial resistance in bees and using those as a biomarker. And then secondly, a study from Namir where we looked at, you know, can, do bees um, reflect the emissions from the um, Doniambo smelter, which is located in the middle of uh, Namir, and does that pose a risk? And we, separate to that, we did a study looking at soils and dusts, and then we did a separate one looking at bees. And, you know, pretty clear that dust is a much better indicator than soil, and bees also are a pretty clear indicator and, and are as good as measuring soils. But the best thing about bees is you can go to a, a limited number of hives um, dispersed across and away from a point source and use those to assess uh, contaminants. And I've done similar sorts of work uh, also in Sydney and Broken Hill in relation to bees. And so we've used it in this case to look at emerging contaminants and look at the fate and transport. And, you know, and we're asking that question, can we use bees as a really good biomonitor for urban pollutants? And I, I, I'll foreshadow the answer. I think the answer is yes. Oh, I'm, I'm doing next slide on my end, which clearly doesn't work. Um, <laughs> Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to insert the URL here, but our science roadmap is now available online. And um, apologize for not putting in the URL. We can, if we're going to distribute these slides afterward, Richard, maybe we can um, update that. So we've done a significant piece of work in science to really pull together uh, what a science purpose is and to identify uh, the focus areas for science. And ultimately, ultimately, the purpose of science is to deliver regulatory impact. Um, we're also very highly focused on making sure that we invest in our people. And that's always a challenge, um, whether it's through L&D or opportunities to work in different areas, whether it's in government or within the EPA, so that their skills and knowledge can be uplifted and stay current to, to the issues. Um, and, you know, we are actually very focused on ensuring that we are addressing issues now, but we're also preparing ourselves to deal with issues into the future. And, and, I, and I give you a good example of what we're doing in the future issues. As you would, most of you would know that, <clears throat> you know, wastewater treatment plants are regulated for standard suite of contaminants, but they're not really uh, assessed for emerging contaminants that we know that are present in pharmaceuticals, uh, personal care products, uh, makeup, um, and a variety of other contemporary chemicals. And these 
uh, less well treated in uh, wastewater standard wastewater treatments and bed filtration treatments versus reverse osmosis uh, uh, wastewater treatment plants. And so we've done a piece of work looking at the prevalence of those and we've published that online. You can find that online and go to emerging, just Google emerging contaminants, wastewater, you'll find, or recycled water, you'll find that report online. And so we're really looking at the prevalence of those and we've done a separate piece of work looking at um, how do they pass up through the food chain and we've done some work looking, it's not ready yet, but we've done some work looking at um, the reuse of, or the use of water downstream of an effluent plant um, for um, irrigating uh, crops and, and how that how any emerging contaminants are moved through that system. So we try to keep ourselves abreast of contemporary issues and legacy issues, but prepare ourselves for future issues. So as you all know, and, and this will be no surprise to everybody, we all kind of got caught out by PFAS around about 2015. We all kind of knew it was happening, but you know, the Oki and the Williamtown matter really caught many scientists and regulators out because we weren't we weren't across it really in the same way as the states and we had a huge amount of catch up and you know none of us want to be in that position again and largely we're in the sort of same position around microplastics um you know the microplastics were well and truly out the bag before we you know really had our attention focused on it and so by staying abreast the future issues allows us to be better prepared have a look at the roadmap it's available for you to contemplate it's i think it, it's only about there's a top and tail of a page, but it's basically three pages. And, and all I can say is it took an enormous amount of effort to whittle it down from 40 pages down to down to three, which is really sort of um, distill what we're all about. Next slide, please. Just before we do, Mark, so with your roadmap process, uh, you're trying to cover a lot, right? Um, do you try and rank these based on your current understanding of the biggest risk to the community and the environment or so, yes so and, that that doesn't sit in the roadmap that sits in our priority of harms because <laughs> clearly and we we've done us we do scanning work to look at you know what the risks are etc and Obviously, there's a list longer than a you know a Macquarie dictionary of, of stuff in the environment that we could deal with. So, if I was to summarise it in simple terms, we have made we make decisions around basically where we can get our biggest bang for buck, you know, where we can have the biggest impact because we cannot. It, it is just physically not possible to address every single pollution item or issue. So we really use a risk based assessment to ascertain. You know, what's the broad risk? Um, is it within our remit? And, and, and you know, are we, do we have the capability uh, and remit to actually tackle those problems and, and where are we going to get the most effect? And so that's where we, that's how we make a decision. And our priority harms are, are listed um, on our website, but also you can see within our strategic plan, it talks really about, you know, what our goals are, what we hope to achieve. And sitting under there, there's our annual plans that help us focus our work and why. Do you ever get community funding to supplement your core funding for programs like the Baywatch and that sort of thing? What, what do you mean, community funding? Oh, uh, like I guess um, what term I'm looking for? I guess open source funding. You know, like you might run a program to like we get quite a few inquiries at Hydrotherapy for people who want to stick their own sensors on poles because they swim in the bay every day. So there's obviously people willing to spend the money. Um, yeah. Have you ever tried raising money to supplement it to you know, get a broader coverage? Or yeah, I, I think that's a bit sad. that that then um, becomes it's a bit of a tricky space for us. We we can receive money from obviously from government and and other major government grants, and we get onto uh, you know partnering ARCs and CRCs, but we wouldn't go out and do fundraising like that. Kind of funny because you've got this aspiration of you know science for community, and then there's a whole bunch of people in the community that would like to fund that science. And currently, maybe there's a, a bit of a barrier there. Just something to think about. I'll move to the next slide now. So this is a brief summary of how we stay connected to expertise, other expertise, 
we're involved in CRCs, as I mentioned before, we, we're involved in uh, ARC linkage programs and some ARC discovery programs and a variety of other major pro projects in ESP and, and NHMRC. Um, we're involved with ICHEMS, NHealth and the National Chemicals Working Group, and we have significant involvement in the design and, up, um, uh, and updating of the NEM. Um, we're also involved in uh, with HEPA. Uh, the CEO attends HEPA um, every time they meet, and I can't remember the frequency, I apologise. I think it's a bit less than monthly, I think it's quarterly. Um, and since I started in May 2023, we had, uh, we had all the EPA science teams from New Zealand and Australia come to Melbourne uh, and to help us figure out how we can better work together, how we can harmonisation across jurisdictions and how we can really share resources and knowledge. And to, much to my surprise, this is the first time that all EPA science has come together. And since that time, we are providing advice to HEPA and building some action plans to help give them some support and insight on areas of focus that really reach across jurisdictions. And you know, one example of that is emerging contaminants, every state's dealing with it, and, and also the, the, the circular economy. And we, we're meeting this month to finalize those action plans. And obviously we like to attend conferences, not only because conferences are fun, we get to talk to uh, all of you out there, but we also get to talk a bit about some of our science, but also importantly hear about what other people are doing and why they're doing it and get to get a feel of what's happening in the community and, and new insights. And I think it's a really important part of our L&D. Next slide. So just I'll whip through a few things here. It's measuring science that matters to the public. So next slide. So my career has been littered by doing tons of fun things and it's been an absolutely fantastic journey. And here are some of the things that I've looked at, you know, bees, backyards, chickens, drinking water, red wine, wildfires and, and blood and PFAS uh, levels, blood lead and uh, PFAS levels in, in firefighters. And I'll just quickly whip through some examples of that. So, you know, we did a study ages ago looking at, I think it was 2018, looking at honey, and we want to use honey as a marker for trace elements contamination um, in, in, in urban areas and also looking at the transfer from um, legacy contaminants into bees into honey. And, and we also, as part of that work, we looked at, um, we, we collected a hundred honeys from around the world and we wanted to include in Australia, we want to ascertain, can we use trace elements? And this is a piece of work with the National Measurement Institute. And we use trace elements to understand the source and location of those honeys. And in doing that work, we had to ascertain if the honeys were authentic. And it turned out that about 20% of Australia's honeys and nearly 30% of global the global sample that we took were not authentic. And we identified that using the carbon isotope 13, 12 method. And we showed that, that there was too much sugar in the honeys and they were not, and, and that's sugar not coming from uh, pollinated flowers, but more from a sugar beet, for example, and, and sugar cane, non-flowering C4 plants, not C3. And, and that caused a bit of a storm. Um, and, and I'm proud to say um, we're covered on the front page of the Herald, Sydney Morning Herald, and also the, the Age. And it was a great storm. It was a fantastic piece of work that my PhD student, Zhao Tang, did at that time. So that's a really important piece of work because if you're buying honey in the supermarket, you want to know that it's honey. It's not honey mixed with some sugar because obviously a kilo of sugar is a ton cheaper than a kilo of honey. And so that, I think that's the problem where we get led to you know, dilution of, uh, of an authentic product with a non-authentic product. And you know, that led to some changes in industry, which was a great outcome. Next one. And, and another uh, piece of work that we did, and I did it with uh, Dr. Louise Christensen, who's now at New South Wales EPA. What we did was we collected um, a 60 year record of red wine from uh, McLaren Vale to ascertain, you know, does that wine really represent atmospheric chemistry? So we knew when it was bottled, so we had an idea when it was grown. We tried to make sure that the wines weren't blended or mixed from different regions. And what we wanted to know was, does the wine reflect atmospheric chemistry over time? And so on the right-hand side here, we have got um, 
the solid line without any dots on it, that's the leaded petrol. And we did a piece of work, or Louise did a piece of work calculating emissions from leaded petrol over time, looking at the sales and looking at the concentration of lead. And we can see over time that leaded petrol emissions decline. We then also looked at, if you look at the, 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 the if you can see it, the image, the line with squares on it, that's the air lead concentration in Adelaide. And then the other line, the maroon line with the circular dots on it, that's the concentration of lead measured in South Australian wine. And, you know, simply to, simple to say, you can see that all of these things are related. There is a very clear pattern. It's never going to be perfect, right? These are environmental samples, but you can see when lead emissions decline from vehicles, you can see that lead emissions, as you would not be surprised, lead emissions in the atmosphere decline. And that's also paralleled by declines in uh, concentrations in red wine. And suffice to say, um, if you look at the concentration in wine, you can see really it only, it's really only after about 2000, the late, the late 90s and early 2000s that the concentration of lead in wine falls below the Australian drinking water guideline of 10 micrograms per litre. So if you've got any ever old wine, somebody said to me, what do you do with that? I said, share it with a friend. And on the left-hand side here, you can see the lead isotopes. And look, I, I, I'm not going to try and explain this in the time that I've got, but what we were able to show is there was a shift over time from the composition that we measured uh, in the air and also in the wine, going from unnatural, which mimicked leaded gasoline, through to more natural isotopes, which maps the soil. And basically, that confirmed the graph on the right. We showed that during the peak of leaded gasoline emissions, which contain typically broken hill lead, that the, the lead in the wine matched the lead in the air. And we can see as we reduce the lead emissions to the environment, the composition of the lead, the isotopic fingerprint became more natural over time. So, and needless to say, I didn't get to drink any of the leftover wine. I chose not to do that. I know some will probably think about what happened to all that spare wine because clearly you don't need to use a whole bottle. Can we go to the next one? And then I've really mentioned about bees and, and, and honey already, so I won't wax lyrical here, but I'm really proud to say we were the first people, others were doing it, but we were the first people to publish the use of lead isotopes in honeybees and honey. We picked the Canadians and some people in Europe on this. But what we were able to show here is if you look on the right hand side here, I, I'm not going to get into the detail on the left, but on the right hand side is our lead isotope diagram 06 over 07 on the vertical axis and on the horizontal 08 over 07. You can use any combination of the isotopes to tell the story, but it's best to use these ones, the more common isotopes using quadru uh, quadruple ICPMS. Previously, we've done some work looking at Sydney aerosols which is that envelope, the orange envelope in the middle. And then in the middle of that, there are a variety of samples which cover bees, the honey, the wax, and also local soil and dust. And what we showed was that the bees, the honey, the wax, for example, it looked very similar to, or fell within the envelope of the leaded gasoline period. Although we were like 20 years past the major point of emissions. What that tells you is the lead that was deposited during the peak leaded gasoline period is being remobilized and recirculated into bees and honey and wax. And we were able to, we were able to identify a very similar thing in Broken Hill. The lead signature was much clearer in Broken Hill, very like the Broken Hill lead. And you can see that overlap in the bottom left-hand corner. The top right is more the natural background uh, samples. And again, they look, they correspond. Background samples look like the background soil. But the interesting thing is, is that the leaded gasoline that was emitted and deposited during the peak period is still present and is still being remobilized into biota, clearly into our food systems. However, don't panic. The contaminant, contaminants are largely in the bees and not in the honey. There is a tiny bit in the honey, but basically the bees have it and sampling the bees is a much better uh, use for biomonitoring than actually sampling the honey. But look, I don't want to get onto left, it's too complicated. People are going to read the study. Go to the next one. Have you been using humans to um, do directly with blood samples to just look at what we're absorbing? 
Yeah. We've done a bit of that work, but that's more around in Broken Hill. Maybe that's on one of the next slides. Oh, there you go. There's your answer. So we, we've, um, we did the, the longest and largest study of blood lead uh, in Australia. It was about 25 years and about 25,000 data points. And um, we assessed, we assessed you know, the relationship between proximity to the, uh, in the bottom left-hand diagram, proximity to the operations, which is the brown hashed area, and, and, and blood lead. And although this diagram doesn't particularly show it, which shows the diagram a bit like measles, the, the values which are both, this is a, a um, 2020 blood lead concentrations, and we've got a time series, and there's a video somewhere it's somewhere online, you can access it, that I did five minute video telling the story, 25 year story of Broken Hill. Um, oh, there, there's a link at the bottom. We can see at Broken Hill, the concentrations are typically, you know, when you do the analysis, they are worse, closer to the mine than more distant. But you can see from that map on the bottom left, no place in Broken Hill is safe from elevate lead exposure in kids. You can see red dots and, and orange or dark brown dots scattered right across Broken Hill, you know, up to, you know, sort of four Ks away from the line of load. And that shows you how easily dispersed lead contamination is. The diagrams on the, uh, on the bottom, what these show you is um, the, on the bottom left-hand side, it shows you the rise of blood lead uh, in a child, and it shows it rises inextricably from zero up to about 18 months of age and then tends to plateau. And that's because, you know, as kids age, they start moving around and they start to get exposed to dust. On the right hand side, we were able to separate indigenous and non indigenous kids, and largely it's the same until they're about 12 months of age. And then we see a separation uh, of uh, risk between non indigenous and indigenous kids. And, we don't actually really know the reason. It's probably to do with uh, people's behaviors and where they play, et cetera, which might increase their exposures. And then I reckon the killer diagram is up here on the, in the middle, which is the uh, XY plot with the little inset in the top. So the inset in the top shows blood lead in kids plotted against uh, lead production rates. And you can see, I can't actually really see it, Richard, I'm afraid, but I think the, uh, the the correlation is it's about 0.8 correlation between blood lead and lead production and when you distill that over a time series in the middle the red line shows the decline in kids blood lead over the last 20 years over a 30 year period and the blue line shows you a reduction in production that rhymes didn't realize it wasn't intentional and so what this tells us is that production activities are really important in, in driving kids blood lead and that's because production equals lead in air and, uh, and I've got a separate diagram, which I haven't shown here, that lead in there really relates, is very strongly related to kids' blood lead. And it's the same thing during the leaded gasoline area. The liberation of uh, dispersed sources presents a risk of harm. What goes up comes down. What goes down can get into kids' hands, which can get into kids' uh, bodies and elevate blood lead. That's a very quick story of 25 years. Next slide. You think... Uh... <clears throat> given the study that we, we, we're quite obsessed with soil and contaminated sites and things, but it seems that that sounds like it's an air quality sort of driven pathway more than soil. So we asked that question. We've asked that question. Is it soil or dust? And short of going into a long-winded discussion, it's clearly driven by dust. And we demonstrate that in a couple of studies. Dust Soil is important because it provides a reservoir for the dust, but dust lead is really is the critical aspect. Because if you if you look at that diagram on the bottom left down here, kids when kids' blood lead is rising between you know zero and twelve months of age, kids at between naught and six months of age, they're in the cot or they're on mum. They're not rolling around in the garden dirt. They're just not. So how do they get leaded? They get leaded from emissions, which become depositions, and it's falling on the hands or the mum's clothes or the mum's breast, and the kids ingesting it. There's an, it, it cannot be soil directly. It can be indirect, but in a place like which, which means in a place place like Broken Hill, you you must remediate the ongoing emissions to the environment, and we know there are emissions, but you must also address 
legacy sources in people's gardens. You cannot do one without the other. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I reckon I'm going to run out of time here. But we did another study looking at backyard soils and, and, and lead in chickens. And what we showed was in order to keep the lead concentration in egg lead below 100 micrograms or 100 parts per billion, soil lead needed to be nearly one third the HIL guideline at 117. Uh -huh. but there's no standard for egg lead. So we used this proxy of 100, which others have used, and it was used in Europe and in a couple of places before. But essentially, we were able to show very clearly that in order to keep egg lead, egg lead below a reasonable concentration of 100 ppb, soil lead needs to be much lower. And that actually is really important in helping people understand where they should keep chickens or what they should do in terms of remediating their yards. Because we've collected, as I shown on the left-hand diagram here, significant amount of information in relation to soil lead concentrations in, in people's backyards. And, 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 and that's all published, published information. And that's literally, thousands of samples like i think there's about ten thousand samples from from sydney and about six thousand from the melbourne area results are the same next one okay sorry right look let's go on let's go on let's not do this because let's just finish because i know i can see we're running out of time and people have other jobs to do I unless you want to talk about the pfas because people like pfas anything I've but questions lined up as well mark are you able to go for a couple more minutes or? sure yeah yeah so look we did a study looking at pfas in firefighters supported by the metropolitan fire brigade now known as fire rescue victoria it was a randomized controlled trial gold standard and we looked at the efficacy of giving a phlebotomy giving of plasma and blood to reduce pfas levels and essentially what we showed is those who gave plasma, we, and they gave it more frequently than blood because they could, it resulted in a 30% decline in PFAS levels. Uh, PFAS levels it was, but PFAS more generally, uh, but particularly PFAS levels, which is the primary contaminant in firefighters. It was about 10% decline in people who gave blood. So it was less efficacious, but people gave a sample, I think, every 12 weeks, whereas the Plasma is every six, so the frequency was different. And we ran the trial over a year. You can studies at open access, so you can read it. And we compared that to the, the do nothing group. So you can see the observation group, there was no change. You can see there was a significant change in, in the blood and the plasma donation. It's the world first trial to do this piece of work. And we were the first time we could show that there is a possible treatment for removal of PFAS from people. There are other people looking at the use of um, cholesterol type drugs as well, um, but you know, cholesterol type drugs have got other, other adverse effects, but this works. And um, you know, we gave evidence about this to the uh, Senate and had one of their several inquiries about PFAS. Next slide. I, I don't wanna talk about microplastics if it's the next slide. Now move on, we've got no time for that. I just want to finish on this last one. So go to the next slide. Yeah, so I've got a little problem with IT. This is this. Oh, so, let, not, don't really want to get into this, but there's been significant impact from doing science that matters for people. And whether it's in drinking water, whether it's people's garden soils and other impacts when it's associated with talking or doing community-based science or retail science, as my boss calls it, and, and it's resulted in multiple media um, discussions for me. I mean, fantastic discussions about getting out, why science matters, what you can do about it. And, and all I can say is I encourage people to do more of that because it really engages people, it helps build that social alliance for talking about social license, about talking about and using science to, to better aid protection from pollution and waste for both environment and public health. Let's go, um, let's go on to the Teddy, and finish off very quickly on Teddy. So we have done a review of instruments using, um, uh, using a scoping review method, and it was led by Emma Baker, Professor Emma Baker, and the other colleagues, Christine Peters, Christine, uh, Cynthia Barlow, uh, Mary Forbes, Megan, and, uh, Amy, and myself that worked on this project. And, and the study is available. If you go to the next slide, um, that, go to the next slide, please. 
the study is available online. You can read that study. And, and that really stimulated a piece of work that we're now doing. You, ABC ran a story on it this week. You can get the link and have a look at that. If you go to the next slide, what we then did, once we'd done the scoping study and we realised that it was a significant, we knew that anyway from the media, there was a significant increase in psychological impacts from fires, industrial fires, natural fires, flooding, um, and, and other environmental impacts. And we identified that some of the you know, primary issues were you know, depression, anxiety, general mental health, and distress. And so what we've done, go to the next slide. What we've done is we responded to recommendations of the first piece of work that came out by Adelaide, which basically said EPA should lead the development of a tool which would help enact uh, that gap in our act that I talked about earlier. And it would help us focus on not only the not only the effects but also some of the causes and it would help us you know so we then sat on that journey which helps us helped us develop what it, what i can understand to be that we're the first regulator to develop a tool that allows us to assess psychological health impacts from pollution and waste and we're using if we go on to the next slide this we're using um well let's come to the next slide we're using, go back there, yeah, we're using what's called the K10, the Kessler K10. It's a standard instrument. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has used this to ascertain norms across the nation. And um, we actually talked to multiple end users and looked at different tools and we ended up using this method because we ascertained from the work that we did when there's a pollution impact, whether it's from PFAS or whether it's from lead emissions or whether it's from air pollution or industrial event or odour, for example, the community experienced distress. And that was the biggest and clearest marker. And so we're using the K10, but we're topping and tailing that with specific questions to get a bit more insight in particular events. Let's go to the next slide. And so this year, this financial year, we've done working on this study too. We're developing uh, and trialing the tool to get more exquisite and detailed information about the efficacy of the tool, the community response and the value and benefit. And we're building a dashboard uh, that will allow us to give sort of automated feedback about um, what the community have said about the harms. We'll probably end up using um, uh, contour maps or, or heat maps to actually distribute those aims in order to protect people's identity. So the whole thing's de-identified. Um, it'll have built-in referral services and it'll how it allow us to get information about which people are being impacted and where. So if you're looking at a pollution incident and we're trying to execute our remit as an EPA, we can also say we can say to industry, hey, not only did you break your license and you've emitted all of these um, particles to the air, we've measured that, this is the impact, but we can say, so that's the environmental impact. Then we can say the other part of our exit, we have to protect human health. We've undertaken um, this assessment using the Teddy, and we can demonstrate you've caused significant distress in the community. And you can see that distress is spatially aggregated higher close to the facility further away. Look, that's the hypothesis. We kind of know that's what happens when we've dealt with the other incidents. And we know that the communities face distress where they've been flooded and they've lost their homes. And we've seen that in New South Wales. We've seen it recently with impacts up in Queensland. And we've seen it also in Victoria. So we, we, we think it's going to work. We think we're going to get really pretty granular information about the impacts and how people are feeling. Um, and obviously, as was stated in other res from responses from the broader research community and, and the end user community, the proof in the pudding will be you know, how that might stand up in VCAT in due course. But we're attempting to close that gap in our act by building this tool. We'll be the first regulator to have a tool that allows us to assess psychological impacts. And we know there are distress in the communities, whether it's from a proposed development, an actual development, whether it's from an industrial or natural event. At this point in time, there's no systematic agreed tool to measure those effects. And that's the gap that we're closing. And if I'm really honest, I feel really proud of the EPA for stepping up and trying to close that gap. It's quite courageous. It's a different space for us. But we know from the work that we do and the conversations that we have, taking into account community concerns is really, really significant. But actually, you know, putting those into metrics and having some formal data is actually much more difficult. And this will help us close that gap. Next slide. So, yes, it's, it, 
there is some changes because it wasn't centered. So when it goes from Mac to Windows, it, it kind of messes up the format. So it was all left justified everybody before. So science that matters, measuring what matters to the public. I think it's really critical. We address community concerns. Pollution remains an ongoing concern for the community, whether it's from water pollution, actually the beach reports or air watch or garden set, the evidence is demonstrable and we know people are concerned. And when there's a perception, there's a problem, you have a problem and you need to deal with it. And I always say, you know, as a, as a regulator or even as a researcher or anybody like that, you need to ask what you can do for the public, not what can the public do for you. And so typically, We've often asked, as a research, I put my researcher hat on here, we've said, what can the public do for us? What information can we get from them in order to promulgate our research? We should flip that and say, what can we do for you? How can we assist and support you? And programs like Beach Watch, Garden Safe, Air Watch, about this is what we can do for you. This is how we're helping you. I think ultimately, ultimately the community see a strong, authentic and honest voice. And they see, you know, not spin, they see data, science, evidence, transparency, publish that information. And, and the EPA, uh, we seek to do that in all possible cases. And, and we, we know that, you know, we can, uh, and you all would know that you can be subject to FOI and you have to cough up the information anyway. So it's better that you publish the information up from early in reports and make it available and, and just be honest about the findings and then provide information about, you know, what you're going to do about the problem and why. And then ultimately what I always say, Little things matter. You picking up a piece of litter or not choosing to discharge your vehicle wash down into the stormwater drain, which will get into the creek, which will get into the bay, but to do it on the grass and light to soak in. These are only little things, but we can all do little things. And I think the more we're able to convince the community that they can have a very positive and cumulative effect, it will really change the dial. And you know, that's why community is central for EPA to focus on prevention and community impacts can be achieved, significant impacts by engaging the total population. And that's what we seek to do at the EPA. And that's what I've sought to do in all the work that I've done. Richard, I've rabbited on for a long time. I've kind of run out of gas and there's a gazillion yeah. questions to answer. Thank you so much, everybody for listening. There's still a lot of people here. So if you're happy to answer some questions, Matt, yeah. that would be fantastic. It does make me reflect a little bit that you're putting a new view on regulation, like maybe reminding people that regulations are there for the community and, you know, making it more real with that link through to psychology is a, is a good one. Well, I think you can change it. You know, re regulation has many forms, many forms. And we've had this debate internally. Is regulation the same thing as being, um, you know, as being an authority? And the answer, the internal preferred is yes. And back about us running these programs, outreaching, outfacing programs is about regulation. It's but it's not regulation as giving tickets as we would typically see. But it's about supporting the community to make better decisions. And it's you know it's indirect regulation. So if you provide people about you know, information about air pollution, soil pollution, but also at the same time provide guidance and advice about what they can do to mitigate and minimise their risk. You're doing your job. You, EPAs can't solve all the problems in the world, but we can help people take positive action to mitigate risk and minimise it. Oh, God. Yeah. So, for those of you who don't get your question read out today, um, there's a way to avoid that outcome. Um, I will read them out and then Mark, if you have to go up the answer them. So question number one, information on the key factors which generally influence EPA's regulatory decisions and actions for contaminated sites. Health risk assessment and guidelines. You know, we have we have guidelines about um, allowable concentrations and the reuse of uh, soil and, and what's at sites and, and that's what did you know and, and state of knowledge so it could be the NEPM, the NEMP um, and, and also you know what site's going to be used and why so that's how we that's how we determine our decisions evidence-based using the most recent best available information and, and guidance and, and where there's a gap like i.e if it's a pollutant or a contaminant that we're not 
it, it's not in the NEPM or the NEMB. We will then look at the, the best available information, EU or the US EPA, for example, for guidance about what we do um, and how we might deal with it. Very good. Question number two, asbestos in mulch. New South Wales recent concern has happened in Victoria or land for cover recently? Uh, is that a question? Has it happened? Because I don't know if it has happened. But look, this whole issue, and I talked about this in the, you know, the, it was kind of covered in the Guardian, I mentioned it. it. It's absolutely impossible for the EPA to sample every kilogram of mulch or recovered soil or recovered fines. It's just unreasonable. And so what EPAs across the nation do, they set guidelines and requirements and you know there's um, periodic sampling and all this you know agreed sampling programs that people are meant to adhere to to ensure that the fill is fit for purpose you can you know it's probably it it would you and the aim of that is to ensure that the product produced are fit for purpose evidently it's clear that that there are things that slip through the net inadvertently probably largely there's maybe some inadvertent stuff but on the whole i think you know suppliers and regulators seek to do the right thing but it's in it's a herculean task reprocessing it we're in a period now we're looking at a circular economy and reusing it and reusing things in a safe and acceptable way and i think in new south wales they produce like nearly a it's like 800,000 tonnes a year. That's a Herculean task to stay across that and ensure that every single gram, ounce, kilogram, et cetera, meets every single guideline. But the expectation is, is that industry turn themselves inside out to, to meet that standard. And, and we have the same sort of process. Question number three, the debate about nuclear power and climate change seems to continue. What are your thoughts on long-term waste storage and risks? Oh, yes, that's a little bit outside of my jurisdiction. However, um, other countries do it and they've done it safely and effectively. The debate says something, it depends which side of the fence you sit on, but and, and nobody's gonna want nuclear waste stored in their backyard, right? Let's let's be honest. It, and that's the that 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 that's that will be the biggest hurdle. But but some have argued very clearly that nuclear power could provide an important transition to a completely uh, a carbon free energy source. But my understanding is to build nuclear power plants is like 20 years leading time. We may have already missed that boat. I'm not across it. I can't talk about it in, in detail uh, and still the people to ask on that, and that they have to remain agnostic on, on the use of you know, advocacy of nuclear power. But certainly other countries are using it and have used it. Um, safely, you know, notwithstanding that in Japan, the tsunami made that pretty unsafe for a lot of people. And that was an unusual event. But, you know, um, certainly in Europe, they're using it, France, and in the UK. We, we're, in we're in a difficult situation. There's a study done on where the best place in the world would be for storing nuclear waste and Australia and uh, the middle of China were the two best. Um, so, yeah, from that safety point of view, Australia stacks up really well. Um, number four, just wondering if case studies could also be published. I think uh, a lot of them are based on your it's, it's funny, it's a good question because I've got a couple I'm trying to get out. But a lot of journals don't like case studies, but most things that we do are based on case studies. Um, and an EPA, um, we, we, I, my team is charged with publishing all of its data in, you know, as soon as we possibly can, but, you know, it just takes time, obviously to clean it, prepare it, write it, but, um, there's absolutely zero intention about not publishing the work that we do. And indeed we've got KPIs around that. So if there's anything in particular, maybe you just ask me, um, we, we're not in the business of hiding the data. It's about being transparent. If, uh, if the attendees want something, just send us an email and we can facilitate to get those publications and things for you. Um, question number five. 
question number five, is all the water quality data collected, including heavy metals, available to the public? I think it is all available on DataVic. Now, um, I don't know about the heavy metals, I'll be honest, um, but I'm pretty sure we've made, we've published, we've, the D DataVic contains all of the beach report data, all of the measures that we've collected. Now, whether that also includes heavy metals or not, I'd have to take that one on notice. Question number six, the effect of car emission limits and its effect on the car market in Australia since the introduction of EGR system. Do you know what an EGR system is? Because I don't. Emissions something, reduction maybe? Yeah. I'm not sure, sorry. Uh, I, 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 sorry I don't know how to answer that question. Um, ah, is that how you answer that question? Well, uh, we'll move on to that. Question number seven, topic, EPA strategy regarding temperature risks to groundwater due to geothermal energy projects. Uh, I don't know what the strategy is. I don't know if there's any, how many geothermal energy projects are active. I think there was one, somebody was trying one down in Gippsland. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that question. I don't know the answer. That's a good question. What parameter can be used to determine the seepage of water quality from primary containment into secondary containment? I'm not quite sure what they're what the what they're asking there. They're talking about from sewage or septic systems, or I don't. Know they're talking about landfills. I think it's a fair question regarding maybe in general indicators that can be used. Um, well, I think at a landfill, the leachate has to be tested and treated. Yeah, so I think I think that the premise of the question is quite good. Are there some general indicators that can be used, but we need to know what the source of this one is that we're... That's correct. So if it's all PFAS stuff, let's say, and there's leachate produced, you can measure PFAS, or if it's landfill and waste, just general landfill and waste, and it's in the liner and there's a leachate produced, you'd probably do a general screening, you know, Nepham suite, plus a few other things. I, I, I just, I'm not quite sure what's been sought here. I've often thought that we overanalyze our parameter suites, whereas we might be better off to have general trends, um, maybe measure more frequently. Um, Next question, does EPA apply remote sensing in landfill management? That's a great question. And actually it's something that we looked at recently when we were deciding to use, we, we did a piece of work around assessing the use of remote sensing technology to gather more data simply more quickly. And I raised the idea of using remote sensing to ascertain thermal gradients in waste facilities. Anyway, we've decided not to do that as a first trial. What, we're, what I will say is we're really interested in using remote sense data to augment decisions and, and to expedite intelligence gathering. And we do use it to some extent already. Um, as I mentioned, or maybe I mentioned you before, Richard, that we are using remote sensing to look at the spatial distribution of uh, arsenic concentrations in the gold fields to give us more granular information we ground truth that with some sampling and data that we've already got, but to give us better information about the distribution of contaminants in that area, because we don't, we know something, but we don't know all things. So it's a great question. We kind of looked at it. Um, separate to that, we've actually had the operations team have had a, a significant push in visiting landfills and going out and assessing uh, that they are doing what they're meant to be doing. You know, obviously can't, catch out all people all time, but they've had a, I forget the number of places they've been to, but they had a push in the last 12 months to go out to landfills and make sure that they are meeting their obligations. But it's a good question. I raised it. Maybe it's something we might come back to. For example, looking at, you know, using, I, I thought about using thermal gradients because these things set on fire. Could we use thermal gradient analysis as a remote sensing, uh, remote sensor passes over every, 24 hours or maybe 48 to see if what changes occur and that will help us expedite intervention. Anyway, we didn't choose that. 
we had an open process in EPA about what we should do and what, why, and we ended up doing something else at this particular point in time. I think it's touching on a really important point, which is we have lots of discrete measurement points. What's no, that, sorry? We have lots of discrete measurement points that we use for compliance, but often the interpretation we can do from them is pretty limited in in really determining overall risk. Whereas if you've got that sort of more spatial view of the world, like remote sensing and perhaps modelling that joins the gaps, um, we start to move towards more meaningful reporting. Well, it, it, if you're doing auto remote sensing and sucking in that data and assessing it across all your, whatever it happens to be, and we know they're subject to temporal changes, whereas, you know, arsenic is kind of static, whereas, you know, changing a landfill, a temporal, if you're, rather than sending somebody out all the time to a site to ascertain, which is consumptive, if you're able to use remote sensing, that would significantly reduce the burden on your authorised officers and actually allow them to be more targeted in the use of resources. And also for the benefit of the industry and also the benefit of the community and the EPA, you might then be able to intervene early and stop the whole thing becoming a massive problem, which then becomes a problem for everybody. And, and nobody wants that. So you look, we've started the work in this space about using new technologies, remote sense data, machine learning, artificial intelligence to, to help us make better focused, targeted choices. It's, it's a huge field, but we've started the work. Laro is doing some interesting work in that space as well. Um, better keep moving. Um, number 10, is plastic recycling creating more pollution? Like microplastic than just using plastic in waste to energy? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, it, pushing plastic to for burning, it's not really ideal because you're basically, you're creating emissions. Um, but at the moment, we've got, as you, we all know, there are challenges in recycling plastic. I mean, the first thing is I stop using the stuff, which is really hard. I mean, look, my drink bottle's made of plastic. My toothbrush is made of plastic. <laughs> Toothpaste in the in the tube is made. Of, it's just a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Uh, some plastic is really good. Heart valves and joints and stuff like that, really useful. Some stuff in vehicles, really useful. But some of it's unnecessary. You know, supermarkets, fruit wrapped in plastic, which is, you know, 50 cents cheaper than picking your own. It's like, like it's just doesn't make sense to me. We're not... It's, not real smart. So it's a good question. I think the answer is the use of plastic is obviously inducing the production of microplastics. And I didn't show the slide, but we've published some studies on microplastics in homes and it's significant. Like it's inescapable. It's inescapable whether it's the clothes that you wear, the products that you use, uh, or the furnishings in your home. You are generating microplastics in your house that are deposited on a daily basis. And unfortunately, I cannot remember the stat from the slide that I said Richard move on from, but it's in the slide and the paper's available online. But needless to say, we are all exposed to microplastics. And the question is, how do we reduce that? Well, not buying this stuff or using it in the supermarket. Sometimes there's no choice, unfortunately, um, but you know, making conscious choices. So I don't know if the recycling is creating more microplastics or not, but the if if we didn't use plastic, we wouldn't be in this problem of the risk of creating them. The second thing is in phthalates, I, I, I don't know that answer, but I know there are several studies that have looked at uh, phthalates and bisphenols in people and the work has been undertaken uh, and um, regulation in different places to remove uh, BPA or bisphenol A um, from drinking from bottles. And if you go and buy, if you go and buy a drink bottle at you know, your bike store or something, they'll say BPA free. I don't know what the chemical is that's replaced it, but it's probably equally as bad. I just don't, I'm not across it. It's the answer is stop using it if we can, or, or minimize the use. Use natural products in your home. Because you know, we showed 
it's pretty clear that carp carpets in home slough off and they produce a ton of microplastics. Your washing machine, when you wash your clothes, it produces a ton of microplastics, which gets into the sewage system, which goes down to the sewage treatment plant or into your yard, depending on what system you've got. And no one say that the sewage treatment system is going to filter out those microplastics. It's a big challenge for us. And eventually get out to sea, as you know. I'm sorry, I can't give you a specific answer, but burning them is it's not really a solution. It's kind of a treatment. It's a tactical, it's not a strategy. The strategy should be how can we stop using this stuff? Should we just pick a couple at the end here? Yeah, well, we've only got a couple to go, but one question. That the, there's a dramatic drop in fertility, right? Like measured as sperm count and that sort of thing. I think it's 50% over 50 years. Um, and there's been links drawn between that and various, you know, pollution studies, etc. Does EPA have a view on that? Like, what? No, not. That's really a health question. That sounds like I'm fobbing you off. But um, what got me into thinking about these emerging contaminants years ago is a film, and I saw it on a flight somewhere as I was polluting the environment on a flight. For any, but anyway, I sort of. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Uh, it's called The Disappearing Male, and it was filmed and made by Canadian Broadcast Broadcasting Association. And I've not been lucky enough to re-find it. But if you can find that movie, it is scary. And it talks about what you're talking about, Richard. You know, the systematic decline in sperm counts since the 50s, which parallels with that, you know, in and, and there's no causation attributed here, but the increased use the urbanization of society, the increased use of industrial chemicals in products, et cetera. You know, whether it's the cause or not, I don't know. But without a shadow of a doubt, sperm client, sperm counts are declining. Um, and we also know that as that's declining, we also know that wildlife biota are also declining, but it's the birds in your garden or the insects. So there's something happening. What the source and cause of it is the problem. I don't know. I actually just on this, I listened to this amazing podcast and I forget now which program it was on. It might have been a BBC one, which talked about eels that went to the Sargasso Sea, which is out sort of towards the, um, it's the middle of the Atlantic towards Mexico. And when the eels go out to sea, they change their sex and then they mate. And nobody's actually seen them mate. But what they're finding is, there are less eels coming back from the Sargasso Sea. So they go out as big eels and little eels come back after they've bred and you know, produced. And nobody talked about that connectivity between, I can probably find the podcast somewhere. I know I sent it to somebody from Sweden. It was an amazing story. And I went, that's interesting. I wonder if anybody's thought about, because these things were looking at going out into the ocean, there's all the seas from the Irish Sea, the continent, European continent. I wonder if anybody's thought about the, discharge of pharmaceutical products and what impact that may be having on the capacity of the eels to morph their sex. And of course they live in rivers, which, and we discharge our effluent into rivers in a diluted form. And anyway, nobody asked that question, but I thought, gosh, if I had my career again, I'd probably do that because I think that's fascinating. Is that what's the, what, is, that a, is that a cause to the reduction in the number of eels coming back from the Sargasso study? I, it's just absolutely fascinating in that. I don't have the answer, more questions and solutions, but hey, it's good for us to think about these things. And you know, we're interconnected. We cannot, we cannot separate ourselves from nature. We are nature. We are nature. I would have thought, given there is this massive reduction in sperm, that it would be right up high in the EPA's priority list that we were looking at. But it sounds like you think it sits in a public health area, but your remit extends across to that, doesn't it? Well, it, it, it kind of does in a broad way, but we what we we look at I'm not saying it in, but that's not we're not doing work in that space at the moment. You know, we're doing work looking at the discharge of emerging contaminants into wastewater and how easily they get taken up into food. 
those emerging contaminants, pharmaceutical care products, etc. Understanding what those risks actually are, that this, that's still that's an evolving piece of work, and what thresholds and there's no there's no guidance, there's no guidelines set around that. We we have started on that work, so let let me not say that we're not interested in it, but we've started looking at what's the environment. You know, we're looking at considering the environmental consequences of the different efficacy of different wastewater treatment plants. And um, as I said before, we're looking at how easy is that are those pollutants propagate up it through um, through the food chain. And we're looking at the presence of those. We're looking at what guidance, not guidelines, but guidance we can give in that space. So we're not ignoring it, but we're at the start of that journey which is probably damn sight better than what everybody was to do with the PFAS stuff in the year 2010 when we knew, you know. And that's, we're trying to get ahead of the curve. We're not perfect. We've got a limited number of resources, but we've made a commitment to that space and we've already done some work. And we work with others like CSIRO, UQ, Melbourne, Monash. You know, we, we work with other high quality science people to say, hey, we're a regulator. We need this information in order to make a decision about what's okay and what's not okay. Can you help us? So they do the fundamental research and then we transform it into something, you know, usable. Mark, it's gone two o'clock. Um, I think we might draw a line under that. We've got another 13 odd questions plus a couple more here, but I think, um, look, just really want to appreciate your time today and appreciate the work that you all do. I think you do an amazing service and um, thanks for sharing some of the examples of what you do there and uh, really appreciate your time today. No, thank you. Thank you for the um, now 59 people who are still on and for the 126 who signed up for listening to me wrap it on. I hope it was useful. I hope it was interesting. I'm super passionate still about science. I think it's really important. Social license is critical. And, and Richard, I thank you very much for inviting me onto the webinar. Sorry, it was difficult to get hold of when I was on holiday, but I, I'd be delighted to come on and talk about one of those other things in a bit more detail if anybody's interested or you're interested later. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Mark. There were 300 registrants overall. You should be very proud of that. All right. Thanks very much. Cheers.